on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. I tell people all the time, I'm usually thinking about your dinner before you've woken up in the morning. All of Arizona, everything is just so prickly and pokey. The cactuses and the choyas and the yuccas, everything you touch seems to hurt you. Arizona has its own species of wild grapes. We have wild strawberries, black raspberries, dewberries, a wild mint, watercress, rack and fern. So I get a fiddlehead season. Here we are with this, you know, 200 year old psychedelic tree that's 20 feet tall and nobody realizes it. People will ask me, are you farm to table? Well, Taco Bell's farm to table. It's a matter of what farm, the connection to that farm. I know all my farmers. In our modern day lexicon, if we say processed food, it means something really, really bad. But when you work with wild foods, processing is what you do. Mother Nature is my only boss. Every time I've tempted her, she's always one. That's all I want to really be as an ambassador for the story. I didn't create it. I just get to tell it. Episode 143 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Foraging Arizona with Chef Brett Vibber, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. You've got to try the new naturally flavored colostrum from Sir Thrival. Chocolate with real cacao, vanilla with real vanilla extract, strawberry with real strawberry juice. I've been using colostrum daily and promoting it as a powerful nutritional supplement for over 15 years. In fact, I just had a quarter cup in my blended drink this morning and again this afternoon. With its ability to fortify your immune system, nourish and rebuild your gut lining, repair injuries, aid in muscle growth and recovery, and so much more, I think it's one of the most sophisticated food-based supplements we can include include in our diet. Sir Thrival's already known as the number one source for premium colostrum, and now they've just released three new formulas, chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. They're lightly sweetened with monk fruit and combined with MCT oil to make them more soluble in water and in blended drinks, all while having the same potency as Sir Thrival's original colostrum. They're so good, I keep eating them by the spoonful right out of the tub. Eaten like that, they're like a powdered ice cream, but of course, they make excellent blended drinks too. Again, these aren't those over-the-top fake flavors you taste in so many supplements today. These are flavored with real cacao, vanilla, and strawberry, so they taste great and really clean too. Go to SirThrival.com to see the entire lineup of health-promoting supplements and superfoods and use the coupon code WILDFED for 5% off your order. Sir Thrival, why just survive when you could thrive? Do you love mushrooms? Do you know that eating mushrooms is called mycophagy? Mushrooms are, of course, a cornerstone of the wild food experience, but learning about them can be daunting. Would you like to learn to identify and harvest mushrooms, but you aren't quite sure where to start? Then it's time to check out the North American Mycological Association. The North American Mycological Association has 97 affiliate clubs across the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, so there's probably a chapter near you. You can check them out at namyco.org. For a completely immersive and in-person experience, including lectures, workshops, foraging, and of course, mycophagy, you can attend their annual foray. The 2022 foray will be held in the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. Again, go to namyco.org to register. When you do, mention WildFed and you'll get a free copy of Maxine Stone's book, Missouri Wild Mushrooms, when you attend. Again, go to namyco.org to get started. The North American Mycological Association, promoting, pursuing, and advancing Mycology. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Arizona is one of my favorite places on earth. I first started going there while I was in my 20s, visiting a hot spring there several times a year that was once the healing grounds for Geronimo and the Apache who rode and raided with him. Over the years, I've gone often from the Mexican border up to the Grand Canyon, from the high-altitude forest canopies of the Sky Islands to the arid, low-lying Sonoran Desert. I've even spent a couple of winters in Sedona, which has to be one of the prettiest places in North America. All the while, I've been passionate about wild foods, foraging there and experimenting with the unique ingredients found on that landscape. 
Yet somehow I had never met Chef Brett Vibber of Wild Arizona Cuisine. While I've known many casual foragers in Arizona, none of them have been professional chefs. So this interview was a treat getting to talk with someone who not only forages these desert ingredients, but also cooks with them for a dining room full of guests. You learn a lot from folks who have to think about ingredients at scale, and in particular, efficient ways to harvest and process these foods, as well as ways of using them you just wouldn't normally consider. Though we're on different career paths, Brett and I have a lot of overlap in our food philosophy, and this interview sounds a bit like two friends excitedly conversing about a hobby they both share. Next time I'm on the desert landscape, I'll be visiting with Brett, learning about what's in season and how he uses it. Far from the empty landscape that many people assume it is, he's carved out a wild food niche in a place where water is the limiting factor, where the summer sun can rob you of your body's moisture, and where the dry nighttime air can kill you with hypothermia. In other words, Brett's cuisine is forged in the fires of Arizona's extreme climate, and that makes it all the more exciting. It's a place of sharp spines and venomous animals, of strongly psychedelic plants and even amphibians, a place where not long ago battles were waged to defend territory from invaders and to establish nation states. Historic and also harsh in the extreme, but also incredibly beautiful, giving rise to flavors found nowhere else. This is Foraging Arizona. Brett Vibber, welcome to the show. How's it going? So good, man. Great to have you on today um, to talk to us about uh, the foods of Arizona, man. Give us a little bit of a background on who you are and what you do. Uh, I was born and raised out here, but uh, kind of went went and cooked and traveled the, the country and the world for a long time. Wanted to work for good chefs. And, uh, you know, when we, when we came back to Arizona eight years ago or so, I started my restaurant and, you know, the the idea was going to be to focus on indigenous cuisine of Arizona, be it through foraging or, you know, having, you know, formed kind of these lifelong bonds with some, you know, different indigenous farmers and and ranchers and, and, you know, outlets where I felt like I could tie what had been going on since my childhood into what had become my career. What led you to, well, I guess, you know, quickly, I'd love to hear how you got interested in cooking. And then it's one thing to be get interested in cooking. It's another thing to get interested in indigenous cuisine, wild foods and things like that. Like, what was that journey and how did you end up there? Right. Uh, you know, often I say, you know, I had, a, I had a busy family growing up, but I wasn't, I wasn't one of the kids that, you know, was left to his own devices uh, for dinner or anything like that. And you know, I don't have, I don't have recollections of really like eating, uh, school food or, or things like that. Like my mom and dad made us, made us lunch or we made our own lunch as probably we got older for school. There was always fresh ingredients around our house. Even, even with both my parents being super busy and all of us kids, obviously being, being super busy with sports and different activities, I still have these, you know, fond memories of eating together growing up and, and, you know, what that does for a family's connection and their communication and, and, you know, their bond and, and so cooking and and my whole extended family is that way. I I remember, you know, Easter's and 4th of July's and Christmas's and Thanksgiving where, you know, there'd be 30 or 40 people over at my grandpa and grandma's and, you know, everyone would bring something. And and again, it wasn't stuff out of packages. My uncles were good cooks. My aunts were good cooks. And, 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 you know, both of my parents, I, I still think are, are good cooks. Uh, they definitely, they definitely, I still, I still think are good cooks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm laughing cause I'm, I th- my dad's uh, pretty tight casted with the grill and, uh, and pasta, but, but my mom, you know, baked and, and cooked and, and, and like I said, we, I don't, I don't remember tons of food out of packages and things like that. So I, I think it lent itself into, continuously seeking those kinds of restaurants uh out when when cooking came into mind i started cooking in high school local pizza joint uh and you know that that took me off to italy at one point and you know into into pizzas and and things like that but again uh you know i i look back when as i'd gotten older probably and and realized that I, I subconsciously was always seeking out restaurants that were at farmers markets or, you know, picking things up from local growers. And, and, you know, I have fond memories of that at, at nearly every restaurant that I've ever worked at. And, 
you know, <clears throat> it just kind of came to fruition as, you know, it was time to put my own concept together and I wanted to move home. I always, I always had the plan to move home, but, you know, 20 some odd years ago, uh, you know, Phoenix, the Phoenix dining scene probably wasn't, uh, wasn't sticking out there on the map. I felt, I felt it like had to have been pretty, pretty bad back then. Yeah, Cause it's yeah, not, I wouldn't, I mean, it's not exactly the most hop in state for fine dining that I can think of. Anyway, no, you know, I know it's getting no. better, but right. And I, yeah, it's definitely, definitely up and coming. And, you know, I've, I've really seen a big change in the last, <clears throat> I want to say four or five years, you know, change is coming. You can see that, uh, you know, when, when we did move back here, it felt like a good time and in a good place. And that, it, and that, you know, that time had come for us, but, but really the last four or five years, I think I've, I've seen a big change of, you know, who's coming here to open restaurants and, you know, what they're bringing to the culinary diversity of the, of the city and the city continues to grow. So, uh, no, I, I, I felt like one, I wanted to travel. I, I, you know, I don't, I, I, as much as I love reading, I think I'm, I'm always reading something, you know, one or sometimes more than one <clears throat> book at a time. And, and I've always been that kind of person, but I, I also like to see and touch and feel, and I didn't want to learn about, you know, Italy from a book or France from a book or England from a book. So it just, you know, while you're young and you have <laughs> far, far less responsibilities than you do as time goes on, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, what, what was, what was the point? You know, there was times I, I wasn't ready for college or I didn't, I didn't want to go to school at this point in time. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take some time to go to Europe. And, and I think, I think that's just as important as, as book learning as, is, you know, totally immersing yourself. And I, I think I've always had a knack for small towns. Uh, I, I, you, I feel like I could always absorb myself into the culture, uh, mm. you know, faster and have person more personable connections with you know someone in a town where there's only one restaurant there's only one tavern or only you know one bar uh as opposed to of of, you know of course i have these awesome memories of of you know paris and and rome and things like that but the the countryside i has probably always been in my heart so therefore you know no matter no matter where you go you you feel like maybe you have some kind of you know connection to these people of at least at the very root of your of your, of your cultures where <clears throat> I want to connect. I want to know, you know, I don't, I don't want to go and be a tourist. I want to, I want to come and I want to, I want to be involved. So, you know, that's how I approach food. I think is, at this point as well as I, I want to share my culture with you and, and I'm totally immersed in it. I mean, God bless my wife. My, my refrigerator at home looks the same as our restaurants or, or our kitchens do <laughs> professionally. You know, there's always, you know, some, you know, mushrooms or wild onions or garlic or something to be cleaned or, you know, a quiz at the end of the night of like, Hey, what is in that one deli container? And like, uh, you know, choke cherries, I think. And, uh, they're soaking in brandy. So, <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, it's a kind of, you know, live it, eat it, breathe it, sleep it lifestyle. And, you know, I, I, I've probably always been that way and, and, and just, you know, sharing cultures is, 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 you know, food is part of that. So, you know, to expand upon it is, is just an honor. There's a lot of chefs now who are interested in local cuisine, indigenous ingredients and things like that, but they don't necessarily get out onto the landscape to forage any of it. So how did that end up attracting you? You know, because, um, that's like a step further than a lot of folks are really interested in going. Right. I mean, I tell, <laughs> I tell people all the time, I'm usually thinking about your dinner before you've woken up in the morning. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it is, it's, it's that one more step. And a lot of chefs go with us, uh, at this point and, and a lot of industry people, uh, you know, have gone with us and, and you even see in one day their you know, their greater appreciation for, for food. If this is the life you've, you know, for lack of cliche, cliche, if, you know, this, if this is the life we've chosen, then, then let's do it to the best of our abilities. Let's yeah. be, you know, stewards of the land and, and things like that. But, but for me, it, it was ingrained. Uh, it, it was, it was family. Our family trips were, were camping growing up. They were road trips <clears throat> down a different, different back road or the same back road of, of Arizona and, and hunting and fishing and backpacking and, and, and all that. And I'm, you know, super appreciative of, of my mom and dad for, for that, because it, 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 you know, built your, you're building these foundations as a young person of, of, you know, hopefully instilling, you know, 
the foundations of your youth, uh, you know, into, into your adulthood and, and, you know, things that pass along from, you know, one generation of a family to another where, where, you know, it came from Boy Scouts, it came from family, it, it continued, you know, as I got older. And I, I think it's really cool now that, you know, I, I picked my son up years ago from preschool one day and his teacher said, well, uh, can you come in and talk to the class? Cause Miles has been telling us, teaching us all day about how to dig in the outside of a dry Creek bed for water. If you were stranded <laughs> out in the middle of the forest. And then he said his dad was collecting mushrooms all day. And so, you know, <laughs> we get this an, an impromptu four and a half year old audience of, uh, you know, teaching them about wild foods. And, you know, it's, it's awesome to see, you know, obviously my kids interested in that, but, but when you see, you know, other young people getting interested in that, uh, uh, it's, it kind of, you know, lights you up inside. When I think about Arizona, I, I wonder sometimes if people who visited once or twice, like maybe they've been to Tucson, maybe they've been to Phoenix, even Sedona, um, they might just picture one kind of landscape and not real, or maybe they've been to Grand Canyon and right. haven't maybe not seen like, cause once you punch up in a flagstaff, you're like, Oh, this is a different place. Like now I'm up in pine forests or. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, you know, we've got this super, you know, unique geography breakdown in Arizona, the, you know, <clears throat> Sonoran desert obviously oozes outside of our state borders and <clears throat> national borders a little bit, but, but, most of Southern Arizona is the Sonoran Desert, and it butts right up to this, uh, you know, 5,000 foot incline that runs nearly the whole way across the state, but from, you know, west of Sedona and, or northwest of Sedona, southwest of Flagstaff. Uh, but it runs all the way southeasterly across to what we call the White Mountains out here. Uh, and yeah, like you said, huge pine forest. I mean, tons of snowfall in the winter times. That that's you know that's what lends. I get people from you know really around the world. I guess at this point that'll that'll you know comment on my you know, social media on Instagram or something and say, you know, I didn't know there was mushrooms in Arizona. And I always laugh and think back. My wife is from Chicago, and when we were moving out to Arizona, she moved sight unseen uh, in you know, the last night or most of our, most of our, uh, executive staff in Chicago at the restaurant that we all worked at was from Scottsdale and, or, or and, or based out of Scottsdale. So there was a group of us sitting around in the office and I said, uh, you know, tell everyone one more time, what you think Arizona is going to look like? And she said, you well, you guys know the cartoon with the road runner and the coyote. <laughs> and I, I just, that's all I can picture in my head. And I was Not like, that okay. far off for a lot of and, it. That's pretty good. I mean, and really I, I drive through spots and, and you know, nowadays she's lived out here for almost 10 years now, but, uh, you know, we'll still drive through spots where she says like this, this is what I was picturing. So I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't all the way wrong. Like we have not passed anything except sandy red rocks that are pretty flat for yeah. hours. And like, yeah, I mean, well, we're on our way to something cool. Yeah. But there is but a yeah, lot it, really pretty wild out there. I mean, you know, I was talking right. to you before about Mount Graham and I mean, I would drive up there and I'd be filling five gallon bottles with spring water and, and, you know, hunting squirrels. So it's yeah, like, totally. Yeah. Right. No, totally different world. Totally different world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, I did the same and I did the same in college and in, in Tucson, you can be in the forest 45 minutes away and in, you know, same thing, looking for mushrooms, but you live, you know, in the desert, you're 45 minutes away. It's a total mm -hmm. mind blow, especially when you take someone that's never been here, you know, on, we've got, we've got these, you know, specific routes for the most part, uh, of, of if, you know, we've got <clears throat> someone from New York or someone from out of the country. We took a German reporter a couple years ago, you know, on one of our big loops. I mean, you see, you see everything in Arizona that day, cactus and desert and sand and forest and high desert and chaparral and juniper and pine. It's just, in, you, you can do it in a matter of three or four hours sometimes. I'd love to hear about some of the diversity of wild foods that are there. Um, you know, there's a, a bunch that stand out to me. Um, and uh, one that I'd like to ask about, I'd like to know what's going on with those pine nuts when I'm driving up through uh, Flagstaff well, certain times a year and there's folks on the side of the road dealing in shell pine nuts pretty inexpensively. And, um, 
my God, they're good. Like it's a, it's kind of a pain. I end up just eating the shells of those pine nuts most of the time rather than picking them out. But I'm so used to, you know, you go to the bulk bin at the health food store or something and you get a pine nut and you break that thing in half and look at the core of it. It's so rancid and yellow through. Mm -hmm. And then you get these pine nuts up there that are like about as fresh as they could possibly be. I mean, just completely unoxidized and so delicious. Um, Are those coming out of Arizona? What's the story of those? Yeah, and definitely, uh, you know, you drive through some of those right spots, uh, uh, you know, like the Jerome, Verde Valley, Sedona, Flagstaff corridor, there's pinyon trees kind of all up and down on the side of sides of those mountains and whatnot. And yeah, just that, that time of year, I, I never forget the first time I harvested some and fabricated them my, myself, you know, your fingers just kill it at the end of the day. But all that uh, resin d- develops oh on your God. fingers, right? So what you're talking yeah, about, you're just, you just end up yeah, like, you're just stuck, and you know you feel like your fingernails have, have yeah. you know separated from your finger pad. A little right, bit. But, right. but it's, it's so, like you said, it's so worth it. It's so worth it because you know the first time you have that, you realize just like you do with a store bought potato or a store bought apple or a store bought tomato, you have that. I have, I have that same thought of like how old is that crap that I've been buying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, where, and, and, you know, especially, you know, it goes that, that one extra, you know, step as well. And like, you know, who was growing it? If I don't, if I don't harvest something myself through, you know, foraging, then I, I typically, I know everyone that's cultivating the food for me. Uh, it's not just any, you know, blind order, or a Cisco order guide or <clears throat> U S food service order guide, anymore nowadays and you know people always say like man the way you source is a lot of work it seems like and like think to myself that's just it's just how i go about my week i i see my friends who i think i want to help and support and you know you're constantly seeing people in your network in this world of you know i can get it on amazon delivered to my house and not see anyone or interact with anyone i'm i'm opposite i i I need people i love people i I love interacting and like i said absorbing other people's cultures i can't get that on you know on a zoom call sometimes yeah otherwise it's like the food just shows up and it's it's got no story to you i mean it has a story but not one you know and if you don't know the story you know, I always kind of joke about how it would be if somebody pours you a glass of wine and you taste it. If, if you don't know anything about that wine, it's like it's not nearly as yeah, um, what's the point? enrapturing, right? Then somebody comes out and they start telling you about the place, the winery, the soil, the slope, the, you know, right. all it, that. It transcends you there. Now, all of a sudden, you're having a completely different experience. Speaking of right. which, by the way, I just love the, the wineries up in Jerome, man. It's so cool that... Uh. Once I tuned into that being there, because for me with California, it's just, it's like overwhelming. There's so many wines. It's like, yeah, I'm not that into wine enough to like, I'm going to learn all of that. But out of Arizona, you feel like, (laughs) hey, in in two days, you could know like all the wine of Arizona and and, uh, And and it's bold wine. I like that about it. Right. And I feel like Arizona's uh, wine industry is, is approachable. Like you said, a place like, a place like Jerome, like everybody fits in in Jerome is what we always say. And then you see bikers and hippies and, (laughs) and, you know, cowboys and, um, you know, Mexican and, you know, it's just, it's, it's, I, I love that town. I think like town like that and Bisbee and, and, you know, Cottonwood has a lot of the tasting rooms and same, same thing. Like you, you see, you see, just every, every walk of life in those, in those towns, you know, Sedona is similar where you, everyone is welcome. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what walk of life you come for from what country or anything. You, you feel welcome in those kinds of towns where, you know, it's just, everyone's there celebrating art and food and wine. And it just, I, I, I love it up there. One of my favorite things to do in Sedona. Now, you know, how now they've got the whole foods there. I, what was it called before? There was the, it was like a seventh day Adventist big health food store, if I recall. Um, oh Yeah. But uh, I love to go look at the uh, the bulletin board there for upcoming events and workshops. And stuff. Oh, it's so it's hilarious! Just, right, and anything. Oh. I mean, you could you could be you channeling know, Ashtar kitten. Command, <laughs> right? Or, or learning how to groom a kitten, or you know, yeah, just, or yeah. paint, paint you know, drinking a bottle of wine while you paint the pictures of the Red Rocks. It's it's, yeah. it's oh, it's 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 some of those uh, community. 
some of those community Facebook pages are just, yeah, they're, they're just entertaining <laughs> and I don't need them. I don't need them for anything. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in those towns a lot. We'll be at the Jerome food and wine festival here coming up in a couple of months. So I, like I said, it's, oh, cool. it's like, a I don't, Jerome's like a, especially, you know, weekends and things like that is it's like a, you don't even have to really have a festival plan. The streets are overrun with right. pedestrians and, and yeah. the bars open at 6am. It's just, I, it's, it's it's a good part of the state. It's also the fastest growing part of the state now. Uh, understandable, because whenever I'm there, I'm like, I love that hill climb to get up there. That road is so oh, sketchy, yeah. you know, as you drive up. <laughs> right. It's such a cool spot. But yeah, one of the things I love about Arizona too is I feel like uh, compared to a lot of places, like in Maine, if I'm driving, I'm in this town and then I come into this town and then I come into this town. There's not like, there'll be huge gaps, but it's like, they're still townships. But then when I right. drive through Arizona, it feels like I'm in a town now for the next hour and a half. It's like nothing. Yeah. Then yeah, there's another the town. You know, and when you look at the map, you're like, it's like the wines. When I look at the wines of Arizona, I go like, my brain goes, oh, this is simple. I could learn this. When I look at the map oh, yeah, of I mean, Arizona, yeah. I'm like, I could learn this. There's like very few actual settlements there, you know? Right. I mean, you, outside of the Phoenix metro area, obviously there's a number of cities attached or you know near phoenix but you get outside of that like there's there's nothing connected to flagstaff it's just right. it's just a city three hours away from phoenix and you get to right. tucson and it's the same thing there's hardly really much of a suburb i know a little bit more nowadays than there used to be but but the same same thing and then you know you you can throw yuma in with flagstaff and prescott maybe <clears throat> outside of that we don't there's no other cities yeah it's such a it's you know such a and there's place just stretches and stretch i mean if you and especially like if you want to go you know the chosen way or whatever you can you can avoid humanity <laughs> it's probably why a lot of folks are out there hey yeah. speaking of tucson i know the uh saguaro fruit um just happened so the saguaro yep. cactus um i want to talk about that because i think a lot of people when they imagine the desert or if you say you know picture a cast a cactus they envision a saguaro cactus because it's like yeah. an iconic symbol. Um, but a lot of people don't realize that that produces in, an incredible food. And right. uh, I think one of the, just the best kept secrets of, of the wild food world is that fruit. And it's a pretty harrowing experience from what I understand getting at, after it. I've never got to go out and harvest. So I'd <laughs> yeah, love to we, hear a little bit about that. We, uh, we just got done. It. Yeah, for, for a number of reasons. It's, for me, uh, I tell everyone, you know, this is my truffle. You know, for years I worked yeah. in high end restaurants and, and, you know, that, that was kind of like the most sought after thing is like, you guys have, you know, little chef pissing contests that, you know, in a, you know, bar after work in Chicago, I'm like, you guys got truffles on your menu. You know, that was just the thing it seemed like for years and years and years. <laughs> and, and, and I, I love truffles, but at this point in my life, I, I don't, I don't really import that kind of food. So the, that's, that's the, that's the thing, you know, over the course of the years is this is a really quick season for us. It's really hard to harvest, which means it's quick. You have to get up early. You know, all the factors that go into it means one thing at the end of the day, only, only natives are doing it, you know, the way that, <clears throat> the way that they have and <clears throat> for, for years and years and years and years and years. Uh, and there, there's not really probably that many people outside of, of, of a couple of the, the native nations that, that are, that are harvesting on a seasonal basis. So, you know, it can, it depends on how much rain and, and how hot it is that time, this time of year in Arizona. Uh, so we, we got some decent spring rain, uh, and, you know, just like cactus fruits, like, a like a stone fruit or like a grape, you know, you, you see the fruit for a while before it's ready. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I see the flowers and, you know, the buds, starting to come in, you know, maybe early May or something, uh, you know, to that effect. And, and, you know, with the saguaros and with them being so precious, uh, you know, we, we don't harvest that many of them every year. That, that makes it even more unique as a, as a menu item as well. But, uh, we wait for, we wait till we see them start opening and we let the birds eat them for a few more days uh after that and and then then it's kind of go time so then we're up by about three forty-five in the morning and and poising ourselves uh for whichever whichever spot we're at to forage uh for the day you're you're up that early because the sun's up by about four fifteen in arizona at least it's it's beginning to come up and you and you can see and you know you're looking 
20, 30, 40, 50 feet sometimes up at these things. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, the heat, the heat of the day is not the summer heat of the day in, in Arizona is not, is not conducive to, you know, uh, for, for foraging that well you're and it's not like more. it's not just like a suck it up thing either because it's like it's like no it's dangerous it's dangerous yeah we'll get back to the show in a moment but first right now i'm wearing my new wild fed hoodie we really took our time choosing these hoodie blanks before we had them printed they've got a charcoal body and an olive green hood and sleeves and they've got our food is all around you logo on the front with a really cool foraging basket fishing rod and suppressed rifle on the back with the text hunt forage fish these are super soft and comfortable look great and work well in the field or in town i really love the thickness too they're fairly light and perfect for the spring days and summer nights ahead Right now, they're 10% off with the coupon code HFF10 at wild-fed.com. Show your love for Wild Fed and the wild food lifestyle. Head over to wild-fed.com and use the coupon code HFF10, that's shorthand for Hunt Forage Fish 10, for 10% off your new favorite hoodie. Now, back to the show. Not only is it hot, but, but you know, you get, you get in trouble with, with, you know, controlling how much water is coming in versus going out of you. And, right. and, mm-hmm. and it's just, it's the desert, the desert's no joke. And, uh, especially, you know, survival, survivalist, uh, type, type things where, where, you know, the, the temperature can swing 40 or 50 degrees by, by day and more people die of hypothermia in the desert than from heat. So easy uh, to underestimate how cold it, it will get it's just it's totally it's totally crazy so you know it's getting to the peak of the hottest point of our year so you know temperatures sometimes overnight don't drop under 100 degrees in in the in the sonoran desert this time of year uh so you know i tell people and i just took a new person out uh last week uh, you know it's about a two-hour gap uh by the time the sun is actually up you know the the temperature's starting to rise uh, and for, you know, the reason of it getting in your eyes, uh, and not being able to harvest properly, but at the same time as those fruits start heating up, you know, if they hit the ground, uh, they're just, they explode and they're oozing everywhere. And, <laughs> you know, you're, you're having it decided for you that it's going to be juiced. Uh, <laughs> but, but, you know, we make a couple of things every year. Uh, I've been making a mead, uh, with it every year for about four or five years now, uh, uh, so, you know, a, a desert honey to get it going and, you know, uh, something again, you know, any, anything I make, you know, I want to be honoring the land, but also, you know, pairing ingredients up with, with things that, you know, we're all grown or growing or raised close to one another. I think that's important when, <clears throat> when, you know, bonding these flavors up with one another that, you know, we use honey that, you know, the, you've got a lot of desert, uh, beekeepers that, you know, you can see their apiaries out and about in the desert and, you know, why wouldn't that go really well with it? And and we keep, uh, you know, the seeds, uh, a lot of, we use a lot of, uh, barrel cactus and saguaro seeds nowadays instead of sesame seeds or poppy seeds. And, and it's just, it's, it's a really good, you know, just delve off. I, I, I love seeds. I love their crunch. I love, you know, toasting them. You know, we make, kind of a desert seed tahini uh out of them nowadays and that pairs up well with native beans and you make a hummus with that rather than again you you could have the important ingredients but all of them are available being grown here so wild or cultivated it it for me at this point in my life it's just it's how recipes and dishes come together one thing I want to point out with the saguaro is, that I've always found fascinating is that the only thing really long enough on the landscape to reach them is the ribs of the saguaro and that's, cactus itself, you know, which right. is that's, really neat. That's just, that's just it. So like the Tohono tribe that that's, that still is. And, you know, I see, a, saw a handful of friends harvesting that, that still is how they harvest. So we had a saguaro, you know, it's obviously illegal or maybe it's not obviously, but Hey kids out there, it's illegal to harvest saguaro cactuses. Uh, but if one falls naturally, then, obviously uh on your own property or you're allowed to go about it so we were able to harvest a saguaro some years ago and and i made a traditional pull out of it man i'll tell you what no wonder these people are strong uh just in i mean in enduring carrying that thing they are so heavy walking across the desert yeah and so you know you there's even you know 
history that goes back that says you know there is stature in the tribe obviously and it, it's it's clear to make sense that the better crafted or longer that your that your harvesting uh pole was the more you could provide for your family so it was almost a social status thing in the tribe of you know well I, I can I can reach that one. I can reach that one. I can reach that one. You can only reach <laughs> yeah. these two. Uh, where uh, it's it's it just it says so. I mean, to imagine people, you know, hundreds of years ago walking through the desert, making sure you got enough of these to sustain your family for you know this mm-hmm. season and and things like that. It's just <clears throat> it, it, I I never cease to be in awe of of ancient civilizations in 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 you know societies that were here before us that you're just looking at things uh you know from a totally different perspective of of only taking what we need when we need it only growing what we should in in this season where where uh you know i think current day modern day society we've lost track of that you know we we want to grow what we want we go to the supermarket and we get you know whatever you want whatever cut of cow or chicken or you know pork that that you choose for the night but you know you again you lack you lack some connection and intimacy with the with the product at that point yeah absolutely yeah you know i think one of the interesting things about the saguaro too and i've talked about this on the show before although i'm always a little hesitant to bring it up and and as you mentioned like mm-hmm. when you said like hey kids this is illegal but right. the fl- the flesh of that plant is psychedelic and very few people right. seem to know it and i'm mm-hmm. sure that that was well yeah. understood by the native people of that region but it's they've they've done a good job keeping a lid on that compared to like let's say you know once, once Americans and, and Westerners around the world found out about, let's say, ayahuasca or something like that, it's like right. everybody's flooding into the Amazon. But here right. we are with this, you know, 200-year-old psychedelic tree that's, you know, 20 feet tall and nobody realizes it. And they just mm. drive by them all the time, you know. Absolutely. And, you know, there's, I've seen, you know, a couple of the, you know, native tribes that are south in Arizona will make a, you know, almost a hallucinogenic type wine out of it and, and oh, things cool. like that and have, you know, their, <clears throat> their rituals with it. And it's, uh, apparently quite the, quite the, uh, ingredient. When I'm, uh, down in Sonora that I really love to eat the barrel cactus fruits. You'd brought those up a little while ago. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, I mean, what a cool plant too, the, the way that those spines are shaped, you know, the, the oh, yeah. way that they spiral around the barrel, I think is so cool. But those fruits at the top, which I guess like if, you know, we were going to describe them to people who never looked at them, they, they almost look like a little miniature pineapple or something like that. Oh, but, for sure. So the fruit's kind of acidic and, and watery and, and, you know, I, I kind of maybe lends itself to like a chutney or something like that. But the, the yep. interior is filled with those li- beautiful little black caviar like seeds that oh, you and you were describing using them i mean they're so nutty and flavorful and they have such a great pop and crunch mm-hmm. um, so yeah tell us a little bit about that and how you work with them yeah i mean uh kind of just like you said the the flesh the flesh lends itself uh or you know the out exterior of the fruit lends itself to i mean the the diversity you can make it sweet you can make it savory you can put it in vinegar i have them I have them in so many different forms. One, because they go continuously. <clears throat> it's never too cold and it's really uh, apparently never too hot. Uh, sometimes they're underdeveloped and a little dry at the hottest parts of the year. But but I have spots for barrel cactus that I know I can go to and fill up a five-gallon oh, bucket pretty that. much all the time. Oh, okay. Yeah, and what's cool... Another cool thing about, you know, Arizona climate and geography is, you know, how hypersensitive the, the weather can be. You know, some, you know, a, a five mile by five mile area might get pounded with a thunderstorm when nothing else around it did. Uh, so it's it's pretty interesting and keeps you on your toes with, you know, kind of weather uh, tracking out here. But but those those barrel cactus fruit uh, we just for example uh last week served on a native uh like b- native bean casualet with a local uh pork uh hanger steak on top of it but then uh these crab apples that we had preserved uh went in with a barrel cactus into like you said kind of a s- sweet and spicy gastrique if you will so mm. it had some chilled tapin and and a little bit of uh spruce vinegar and and honey in it and uh, you know, really 
like I said, we've used it on desserts and, and, you know, it's, it's a super diverse wild food that, that, uh, you know, provides the seeds provide so many nutrients and, and, uh, you know, good food is good medicine, uh, just the same. And, and those seeds, I mean, I, I've roasted them and like I said, uh, was saying we've turned them into tahini, we've pickled them. Uh, I've, I've used them in place of caviar on like vegan sushi dinners and, and things like that, that we've done. Uh, it's super diverse, super good for you. Uh, one of definitely one of my favorite wild foods. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, the prickly pear obviously stands out too. And, and for those who've never harvested them or only ever bought them, uh, you are not experiencing the processing part, which removes these little macroscopic mic- uh, microscopic hairs that that's the worst that are the most irritating thing possible to get into your fingers so, or your lips a lot of, a lot of stuff a lot of a lot of things you know you try and stretch out the harvesting season as as kind of long as possible and go back to your spots and you know it's it's lobster mushroom season okay we keep going back it's you know wild we're getting great wild grapes for just for the leaves okay we continue to go back same spots prickly pear probably for the last four years i've told the guys like <clears throat> at first you know a few years ago i said i'm thinking this is how we're going to do prickly pears and like we know you know at this point how much we need kind of for quota every year to make this many different dishes throughout the year and uh you know you get your <clears throat> your numbers down so you know we know we want, you know, six to 800 pounds of prickly pear fruits every year, which is nothing. Uh, but the last couple of years, we've been doing it all in a matter of like one or two days and just going gangbusters wow. and just dealing with it and, you know, making sure we're at a good stand and, and, you know, maybe moving from one or two to three spots uh, throughout the day, but just loading it up, getting all the fabrication done and, and getting it preserved and getting it put away uh, just to go back to the original point you were making because of those glockids they're called uh <clears throat> when we were doing it and spreading it out over a couple of months all you'd hear from guys on the line or cooking or <clears throat> you know prepping was like ah ah, <laughs> ah like ah yeah. everyone's got actual you know not fish tweezers but at that time of year everyone's got their bathroom tweezers in their apron because you just you get them in you there's no way there's no way you're not going to. There's obviously better and smarter ways to go about it, but but no matter what, you're gonna get you're gonna get at least one in you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we just we just we one. just right. We just go we just go nuts and just get it done in a matter of like a couple. How do you days guys do it? Talk, talk to me about your process because um, yeah, I don't have a really well well developed process okay. method. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is, this is life, lifelong lessons, uh, learn, learn the hard way. At that's that's what I'm thinking. Life. I'm going to benefit so, from your experience. Eight, 18 to 24 inch tongs, uh, and then five gallon buckets. I save five gallon buckets in milk crates. Like there's some kind of currency, but five gallon <laughs> milk bucket with a snapping lid. I've had people put them in, you know, ruin their mushroom foraging baskets, ruin their, you know, satchels and leather. Just this time. You get a plastic bucket, you get a snapping lid. Uh, we used to get them from like friends that had, uh, you know, pickles or whatever at their restaurant and, right. and just ask for a bucket when they were done or save up a couple for us. 18 inches, 24 inch tongs into the bucket, snap that lid closed at every stop. Uh, gloves that you're definitely going to throw away when the season's over. Uh, don't put your gloves back in your backpack. Like the, the, uh, uh when I get back and they get dumped out, we do it outside, but, uh, outside they go onto a sheet tray out of the, out of the buckets. And then with tongs go onto another sheet tray. You're going to have a bunch of debris there that you don't have to worry about burning. Okay. Up so you first dump them like out that. onto the, you, sh- you, you put them on a sheet pan so that you can separate out all the junk as you move yeah. them to a clean sheet pan. Right. With, okay. with your tongs all the time, move them right, to a clean right. sheet pan you're going to have a ton of those glockids have fallen off in the bucket. They're, they're airborne, you know, or whatever at this point. So they're, they're going to stay hopefully, uh, on that, on that original sheet tray. Now that original sheet tray, again, I'm, I'm doing this outside. So I go somewhere. I, I live on five acres in the middle of nowhere. So I go to the edge of my property and tap it out and I hose that all off. Uh, light water. Don't spray it hard with the hose. Again, all of these are lessons coming 
from experience, <laughs> experience in the heart. Uh, don't use your sprayer on your hose. Just let it be at its normal flow. But then a, a blowtorch, you can get it at any, you know, just uh. regular, nothing, nothing fancy, but any, you know, Ace Hardware, Coleman green uh, canisters. They've got an attachment for the top. And then I blowtorch him. Okay. I rotate them with, with my tongs uh, and blow, you know, and you're just to burn the, those glockids off and they burn just like hair. So they're really quick. <clears throat> so, you, you know, you're not getting any char or anything on, on the, on the fruit itself. Uh, but from, from there, uh, you know, I, I can, I can work with them pretty well from that point on. It's incredible what's inside. I mean, when you're dealing with, oh, yes. you know, all of Arizona, everything is just so prickly and pokey from the, yeah. the cactuses and the choyas and the yuccas and, the, you know, just like everything you touch seems to nature, nature hurt you, right? But yeah, then well, inside I, there is like this watermelony, seedy, wet, juicy, just beautiful fruit. Huh? Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's so good. And we, like we were talking about with the saguaros and the barrels, their seeds are similar. You know, barrels are obviously a little bit bigger than the saguaro fruits, but uh, you know, prickly pear has almost what looks like you know pepper seeds uh, to it. They're they're flatter and they're whiter. So a couple of years ago, you know, we were you know going through it and juicing and and peeling and coring and seeding, and I just I I I felt like we were throwing too much of it away. I didn't couldn't really find any <clears throat> reference to the prickly pear seeds being used that much in food. So we thought we would just take them out, dry them and treat them like mesquite pods uh, that year. So we washed them, dried them, and then we roast them until they, you know, get some color on them and caramelization, bring those natural sugars out a bit. And then we let them dry again. The desert stuff needs to dry before you mill it, mesquite pods and things like that. Uh, so we let it, we let them dry for about six months and they, you know, we have a sun dryer that, you know, we can put stuff outside and cover it up and it's protected from the elements, but it's still getting that natural sunlight on it. Uh, well, we ground it into a flour, uh, in, and I've been using it in baking for the last few years. I wouldn't have thought you would render anything edible out of those. <laughs> no, really me neither. It. it was in, wow. it was, it's unique. Uh, it's unique. And I, I'd say we, you know, kind of look for it. Uh, it was really hard to refine into, you know, you know, what people are thinking about as, you know, flour. It was almost, it was almost like a cornmeal, uh, yeah. <clears throat> consistency. So, so, you know, it, it, you know, when you're looking for something in texture with baking and bread or something like that, it's, it's lent itself to a nice kind of crunch and earthiness. And, and again, you're not, you're not throwing away you know, 20, 25% of, of what you've collected. Wow. And you just brought up mesquite. I feel like that one deserves a, a little time too. I mean, you know, the, and it, and it seems like with everything we're talking about, there's like multiple uses. Like, cause when I think about most of the fires I've sat around in Arizona, it's mesquite sure. that we're burning very often. Mm -hmm. Um, those pods are, you know, you pick one up or off the ground or off a tree and, and they can be kind of fun to like chew on a little bit, but, but, sure. you know, for some sugars or something, but ultimately this requires some processing. The resulting food in my experience is one of my all time favorite flowers. So oh, uh, talk a, to me about, um, about mesquite and what you guys do with it. Yeah. Another, uh, another hot season, uh, hot season forage, but this one, Mesquite is, it's a staple in our kitchen. It's in, it's in desserts. It's, you know, syrups, glaze, roasted vegetables at different times of the year. It's, uh, you know, it's in a new dish that we have is like a, uh, pinol fried quail with the mesquite flour mm. waffle and a saguaro fruit syrup, uh, with it. Wow. So it's, it's, it's always, <clears throat> it's one of the first foods I learned to forage. It's one of the first wild foods I can remember learning how to fabricate, uh, you know, and, Cub Scout sometime is, you know, in elementary school at some point, but, but, you know, natives call it the tree of life. It can, it can provide you with food. It can provide you with shelter. It's, it's, it's so, di it, like you said, it, you, every fire you've ever sat around in Arizona seems to be around mosquito. We harvest a ton of it every year. It's, it's, it's plentiful, you know, throughout the desert regions. Uh, it's, it's so, it's so vital to, to, native and the wild way of life that that you know you want to honor it and you know like you said it, it it's it's it, 
I find myself harvesting mesquite at different times of the year for different things. You know, it might be wood for the smoker. It might be green wood for the smoker. It might be dead wood mm. from the, for the smoker. It might be, uh, you know, pollen f- to, to get into pasta flour or might be flowers to garnish with. It might be, uh, you know, I'm just, just getting into it. Probably when we get back, we're, we're on a trip here for like the next 10 days, uh, starting on Saturday. And when we come back, it'll be, kind of you know full steam ahead on on uh, mesquite pod so all we do with mesquite uh for the most part you can either be present or not present but even just on my property uh drop cloth around the trees underneath on the bottom uh the pods when they hit the ground are are typical and apt to pick up a toxin out here in the desert uh so right off aflatoxin is that what they they get yeah so it suggests not to eat them, you know, off the ground. It doesn't mean that every single one does, but if you can avoid it, uh, you, then you go for it. So, uh, same thing, uh, you know, I can see them, I can see them flower. I can see them pollinate. I can see them start to turn into seed pods. They stay green. You know, that, that not really any of those times are, you know, times that we're going to harvest, uh, pods for flower, obviously. So you have this this time, you know, while you're in nature that you're, you're, you're harvesting and you're probably in one season, but your eyes are to the next season and the upcoming season Mm. all the times. And, you know, watching, you know, okay, that bush is, is, is greening out again. So that means we're, you know, a month away from flowering. That means we're two months away from fruiting. And, and then, you know, it just, it continues to evolve. And, you know, there's usually a few things going on at one time, but, but we'll get the drop cloths under when, when we see that the pods are nice and naturally air dried on, on the plant. Uh, and then you can shake lightly on the branches to have them come loose or, or, you know, you can leave it overnight or for the day and, and come back and, you know, pick them all up off your shade cloth or off your drop cloth rather. Uh, and so, yeah, from there you can either mill them fresh. I have a lot of friends that mill them and you get kind of a, you know, a whitish flower with a bit of a yellowish, uh, hue, not, you know, just a little bit lighter probably cause you're adding air and pulverizing it as you mill it but it's not the seeds uh that i i find people are often surprised it's the it's the pod and the starch of the pod around the hard seeds that that makes the mesquite flower uh and and so people can picture this it sort of looks like a yellow bean pod or pea pod or something like that right Right, like a yeah long a long kind of you know thicker thicker snap pea you know or a you know i tell people it looks like a green bean that's been pinched all yeah, the way down flattened a little bit. uh right uh and so you know typically we'll mill it in different forms so uh we'll mill it you know fresh like that and just naturally air dried but also i like roasting it uh it, it brings out you were touching on the you know the natural sugar rush that you can kind of get from them and little pick-me-ups and and whatnot so we like to roast it and you know brings out these chocolatey coffee cinnamony uh tones uh to the mesquite and and therefore lends itself again to you know all these different facets of of uses uh we a couple years ago have a friend uh that's a coffee roaster and i took a ton of mesquite pods with him and we roasted them just like coffee beans. And then we did a cold brew out of it. And we made oh, mesquite wow. tir- a mesquite tiramisu for the season uh, with mm. mesquite flour for the lady fingers. And then, and then soaked them in that cold brew, uh, obviously mixed with a little local liquor. But uh, it, it's, it, this, this plant is so diverse. I can, I can just continue to draw off of it for, for a number of different things. It, it, I mean, for something I've been foraging for, 30 some odd years it's it's oh, wow. it's still really exciting and, I, now and, i have a friend who who bought an industrial hammer mill to to work it so i'm okay. curious like that's how he's doing it and uh mm-hmm. you know obviously this isn't something you you do effectively long term in your your vitamix or something like that i mean it's, right it's those it's and i imagine because those seeds i don't know what the rockwell hardness is of them but it's oh very man high. i bought Right. We've smashed them. With, we've tried smashing them with hammers. You know, like my kids will like, yeah. it's like a game to them. Like, I'm going to try, you know, can I get a hammer and try and break this mesquite shot like, or seed? And like, yeah, go for it. You're not, you're going to break my patio. <laughs> right. So how are you guys, what kind of equipment are you using in the milling? Uh, for the most part, uh, I'll do a, a like a three or four step, uh, 
process. And I'll tell people, uh, we're fortunate enough to have friends that have flour mill uh, just on the southeast side of uh, Phoenix. Uh, so when I'm doing them um, in large scale, obviously this process is going to break all of your equipment tr- again uh, <laughs> to speak to speak from some personal experience. Uh, but when you are doing just a small amount, I've, I've told people before that if you have a food processor, so you know we use Robocoop brand, but if you had like a Cuisinart processor, uh, <clears throat> you can blend them there. And that's, that's getting you a rough chop on them. So the, the idea here is that one piece of machine, your machinery is not doing all of this work, but most people have all of these pieces or have access to them. If I, <clears throat> I could uh, have chopped them up in uh, the food processor, then it's usually uh, can, breaks the seeds away from the, the pod at that point in time. I can sift that through uh, a, a yeah. large colander then I can go to a Vitamix and then a KitchenAid. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right. Then a KitchenAid Miller will, will create some very fine, soft uh, mesquite flour. But yeah, we found uh, really around the 40 pound mark of uh, mesquite pods is when you seize a Vitamix up and you seize a RoboCoop up <laughs> and most likely have gummed up and destroyed at least one KitchenAid uh, food yeah. miller. But it, it's the same thing. Like I couldn't, I couldn't sustain, you know, making pasta on a KitchenAid uh, right, pasta right. roller. But but it, it'll last for years at your house. So yeah, you know, probably great machines, talking, not what they're for. Probably, <laughs> right, probably talking about different. You know, we tell people, you know, I, I, if I need a piece of equipment, whether it's outdoor equipment, you know, or or kitchen equipment, uh, my dad told me at a young age that <clears throat> he had to buy me like top of the line things. And I thought, you know, for a second, that's pretty cool. And he said, cause otherwise you break everything. He said, you should work for a company that tests out products like right. backpacks and boots and, and jeans and everything. If something's not of high quality, like production, you know, it wasn't that it was expensive. It had to be like high quality, uh, you know, put together. Uh, cause I, and I still look at myself and like, yeah, I can't, I can't get that. I'll break that if I get that, you know, <laughs> you, you know, I yeah, look at a, like a go to get a new drill at, you know, home Depot and have this man versus self thing for 15, 20 minutes of like, you know, that's the one that I feel like is good for me, but looking at one, like, well, that one doesn't look like it's going to break. <laughs> what about a uh, jojoba? Is that one you've uh, worked with? I, I've, oh, I've eaten them out in the desert till I've made yeah. myself nauseous, but I, I haven't it, done much with them. Exactly. It's a, uh, it, there's there's some things I tell people jojoba and cockleburs are probably the two things that I <laughs> that I like that I don't harvest that much, uh, it, or at least in any quantity because because of the ratio I suppose of time invested versus what I get back out of it. Uh, yeah, I had a cook I had a cook bring in a bag of cockleburs a couple years ago, and I think. I don't think they ever all got cleaned. What is a uh, cockleburr? I out here that would refer to a burdock. Um, fruit, okay, but I'm curious what it means out there. Uh, it's same species, but when they're oh, dry, okay. you can bust open the little fruit, and there's a nut inside of them. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, but the the fr- I, mean, I don't know. Like our our fruits are spiky. They're almost like a star thistle. Uh, yeah, they so it's too, just, yeah, like a little one, right? They, they're like an yeah. It's just it's. Seat. I said he said, well, look, you know, very proud of himself. He said, look what I found. I said, that's nice. He said, have you ever found so many? I said, well, I I mean, I know I know tons of spots where he said, oh, you know, there's a spot down the road that's got a bunch of them. I said, oh, I know a lot of spots that have a lot of them. He said, so how come I don't ever see you use them too much? And I said, because you're going to clean those, and then you're going to tell me if you're ever going to get that many again. <laughs> it's just it, it took him, you know three, four days of all of his spare time in the kitchen to get, you know, a 16 ounce deli container of this processed fruit down. Your fingers are punctured and, and things like that. So, uh, jojoba is sort of in that same, uh, boat for me where we've, we've gone after it a couple of times, but in general, uh, for me, it's, it's one of those things that I can, I can always depend on to, uh, either snack on while I'm foraging or, know that i could sustain myself in a actual survival situation 
Tell me though, like, I'm curious, okay, my experience of it, which is limited, is like I'm walking through the desert and I'm pulling off these, I don't know, macadamia nut size nuts off the landscape. Um, so it's not the same deal with the burdock because that's like difficult to process. What is the challenge with jojoba? I'm curious. Um, I, for me, it's been a couple of different things. One, uh, Getting, getting to it maybe at the right times mm -hmm. uh, for it to be at the peak size. It's kind of a quick season. Uh, but also where to get it into maybe said dishes on the, on the, Got it. On the regular. Got it. Makes sense. Um, what am I leaving out? Because for sure there's some – these are the iconic foods that came to mind when I started thinking about Absolutely. Day, you know, uh, what am I leaving out? I think – I think those are the iconic Sonoran desert food. So, so right. if you move up into the forest, uh, you know, morel mushrooms, bolet mushroom uh, family. So your porcini Just mushroom never family. Never picture that. Never would Lo picture that. <clears throat> tons of lobster mushrooms. So lobster mushrooms wow. obviously aren't a mushroom, uh, but but they attach to mushrooms and they attach to mushrooms. Uh, and it's a parasite that lives in dead bones. Uh, so typically, it's obviously going to be you know, livestock or, or deer or elk or I something. You know, fallen. I never knew that. So, okay. I, yep. I was aware that this was an, a fungus that parasitizes another fungus, but I did not know that it, that it resides or hosts inside of bones. That's really. Neat. Yes. So what's kind of cool is, uh, you know, you can, you can find, you know, maps of, of old Arizona land registers and whatnot and see where, farms were and ranches were and every ranch has a bone graveyard if you will you know just it is what it is it's part of ranching uh and so the sp our best lobster mushroom spot is south of flagstaff with on a spot that's now national forest but must have just been a, this massive ranch back in the day before you know interstates and things like that and man we've got like a probably an acre or so where they just explode all over the forest wow. floor. I mean, it's one of those most choice of edibles, I'd say. You know, the texture oh, is incredible, right? <clears throat> yep. Wow, and yeah. it's cool you have uh, morels too. You must get some burn. Do you do you need burn sites up there for for good morel harvests or, or do you for the most part? The early in the spring, you'll find them a little bit lower elevations, like thirty five hundred feet for us, which is you know low for mushroom growth, uh, but. But those will be blondes, but they'll flush up into this time of year if it if the rains are sustaining us. That we're just through all the burn all the burn zones, which unfortunately at this point there's quite a bit of them out here in the west, uh, as everyone knows. But but you know you have to find some good with the bad, and yeah, that's where <clears throat> that's where we'll get a typical uh, good morel flush. But you know Arizona has its own species of wild grapes. Uh, we have wild strawberries, black raspberries, uh, dewberries, which are like a blackberry family. Uh, Highly underrated smaller. fruit. Highly underrated fruit. Yeah. I've got a I've got a dewberry patch. I was actually oh. today looking at the flowers as I walked by it because it's right on my you know, we yep. live on a little dead end road and and I was I look at them and I think like man people have no idea because their flavor is really you know when you get good ones like ones that are are, are, oh. are hydrated yeah. and getting good nourishment from the soil man they're delicious. I love them. again. Yeah. For, again, for sure. My parents had this spot, uh, up North of, uh, Payson. So kind of, you know, you're getting more East central Arizona, but on the other side of the Mogollon rim, uh, where Tonto Creek and Horton Creek <clears throat> met each other in the summer times, I, I'm, I'm probably, you know, off, but it, it felt like we went every weekend, uh, nearly to hang out by the Creek. And it was, you know, this time of summer and, uh, and we were always just up and down the creek picking dewberries, dewberries, dewberries. Uh, <clears throat> we get a lot of wild mint, obviously, out here. A lot of mm -hmm. watercress out here. Um, I mean, it's it's some kind it of crucifer on and on and on. There's a crucifer I used to harvest that we always talked. We always called it arugula. It was some maybe a black mustard or something like that. But oh, it's, uh, I spent a lot of time yeah. around the around. I was always around hot springs when I was there, and so there was okay. you know a bit of moisture. So right. we'd have, you know, we'd have stuff that you probably wouldn't see around most of the state. Yerba Mansa comes to mind, yep. like just uh, yep. incredible medicinal plant or, you know, glass wart or things like that, that are, and you know, that's the, uh, that's the other cool thing about, you know, Arizona's geography is, you know, through the desert, you know, there's a spot, there's a spot just about 25 minutes from my house, 
uh, that's <clears throat> same elevation that I live in. But the spring, the creek is spring fed and it runs all the time. And in the hyper climate that it creates right next to the creek is just unreal. I love taking people there that aren't from here because you literally park in the desert and walk 45 feet into the forest next to the creek. <laughs> It's just, it's yeah. totally, totally unreal, uh, where, where that, you know, you're in there and, you know, cattails are one of my favorite things, uh, to forage. Yeah, I think, right. I think, I think again, we, we, we can harvest them at all different times of the year, uh, different times in their life for different uses, uh, super, super diverse, uh, wild food. But, you know, the list, the list continues and continues to grow for me. Uh, you know, there's, there's things that you know I know and I find in Arizona and I have found, but things that sometimes you don't find in in prevalence for years and years and years on end to you know actually say like I can put this on a menu, you know, forty five nights of the year. Uh, but but things that we <clears throat> you know always draw on. We we first started collecting acorns about five years ago, uh, just because we used acorn flour at that point, and you know it's that it's that never ending curiosity as well as like yeah, I don't want to buy acorn flour anymore because we have a million acorns here. And, you know, we can do the same thing. We're already making mesquite flour. Just, you know, put it, put it on the list of another sleepless night. Uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, but that's, that's delved all the way into, I, you know, I think we were talking about my buddy that makes uh, Arizona sakis up on the Navajo Nation. He's Japanese. His wife's Navajo. But I've learned so much from him just by being around. You know, he has koji. I, I, I worked in Japanese cuisine for years and years and years and I was always around miso and again ordering really good misos or or you know sourcing really good misos. So over the last three or four years I've I've just I've gotten in that's another one of our <clears throat> preservation techniques is is miso. So it just it adds another another, you know, facet to your creative outlet is you know so now we've got acorn miso and we have tepary bean miso which is a native wow. <clears throat> native bean grown by the tohono south of phoenix and 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 things like that where you know we've got we've got uh bracken ferns up in the forest so i've got you uh, do fiddle, really I, yeah so i get a fiddlehead season i love uh, this i love bracken fern i just did an oh. episode uh we just filmed an episode for season three of our show about bracken fern nice that's one of my also, I, I, say, I guess I put it on the end of everything, but one of my favorite things to hunt for, you know, that they're so abundant, you know, up on the rim, up there in, in mountain country. And uh, same thing, like the, the first or, you know, first couple of years you'd go after them and, you know, you'd put them in something typical of like, yeah, you know, this goes with fish or we're putting it with this tonight. And, you know, over the course of a couple of years, I'm like, you know, I want to get enough of these, you know that I can pickle them. And now I can do like my mm. actual own take on an Arizona bloody Mary when we have people camping with us and, you oh, know, we'll have, yeah. right. So we'll have our own, you know, we make our own tomato paste every year with late season tomatoes and char them and can them. And, and then, you know, that's where the bloody Mary comes from. Thumb Butte distillery and in Prescott makes a beautiful vodka. And, and, you know, so that's where the vodka comes from. Chili tapine can make it spicy. And, 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 you know, we just add one more, one more aspect of of creativity or intimacy to to a dish or a drink at a time where a couple of years ago you know we had pickled green beans and we grew the green beans and we pickled the green beans but like i don't know i was just standing in the forest one day i'm like i'm gonna make a whole bunch of these jars into pickled ones for uh the bloody mary's at camp wild chef and everyone said yeah, that sounds great. And it was, it's, it's, again, it's a conversation starter. Someone gets to hear the story and, and you get to transcend someone to your train of thought of like, I grew these tomatoes and, you know, close your eyes. I was in the forest when I picked this green thing and, <clears throat> you know, just it, it, for me, it, 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 it creates a never ending just well of passion and, and inspiration. It's really impressive to hear, you know, from the restaurant perspective too, because, it's one thing to go out and do these things and get enough for your for yourself or your family or you know yeah. for your season, but yeah, trying to put it on a menu, it's a whole other thing. You know, needing the, yeah. the supply, the consistency of the quality, you know, things like that. And then all, and obviously your your staff must just be pros at the processing component now. Yeah, and you know, I've been fortunate enough to have you know guys stay with me <clears throat> for years on end because you get used to it that way. You know, we we. 
we always tell someone, you know, go where you want, go, go where you're, you know, happiest. And, and, but you, you know, if someone leaves on good terms with us, then you, you always have a home to come back to. And more often than not, you get a guy that comes back or a gal that comes back because you get used to it. You know, you go, you go to another restaurant and, you know, they'll come back and say like, they were, they were buying out all their shrimp. Can you believe their chef's never been on the boat like you and, like, <laughs> caught, caught the shrimp and like their yeah. sock, their salmon, they didn't even know where it was from. It was farm raised. And like, like I'm too used to you like being gone for six weeks, catching all the salmon for the year and then it being off the menu when we're out or like I'm used to going to the trout farm and catching the trout ourselves and, and coming back to serve it that night and being able to tell a guest about it, you know, when they're having a tasting menu. So it just, it, you know, it's not, <clears throat> I tell people often, often like it, it definitely can't be about the money because <clears throat> no one's become a millionaire yet. But, but <laughs> at the end of the day, you're so happy doing what you're doing that as as long as you're you know surviving, then you're <clears throat> you're happy. You can't replace that with anything. Isn't it funny too how how in our modern day, uh, I guess like lexicon, if we say you know, if we say processed food, it just, it means something really, really bad and really, really um, mm-hmm. changed and depleted from what right. it once had. But when you work with wild foods, you know, I mean, processing is what you do. And it's so life. you get this sense of like, right. oh, I get it. There was this time where people could afford to have someone else process their food. That's what it originally meant. Right. Like processed Absolutely. food, right? You right. I tell people, work. I tell people now it's, it's not, it's not that it's processed. All food is processed. It's the process. It's the same thing as people, people will ask me, are you farm to table? And I said, well, fuck Taco Bell's farm to table. They, the lettuce obviously was (laughs) grown at a farm. And that originally I assume was beef on a cow, but it's a matter of, (laughs) it's a matter of what farm it's a matter of the connection to that farm. I know all my farmers, I know they're not in it. Same thing. I know they're not per se in it for the money. They're in it for the passion first. And, you know, the business, you form your business around that passion. I think those are the best people to work with. But, but, you know, to say, you know, you know, I don't eat any processed food and like, well, I processed saguaro fruits for 17 hours the other day. So <laughs> yeah, I, I do. But I, <laughs> right. But you, yeah, right. You watch the process in which it was, in which it was fabricated though. And the same, same thing. I, I, as someone, the lady, a lady asked me, <clears throat> you know, in an interview or a podcast or something at some point was about, yeah, you know, I just, I get sick of, you know, the, the catchphrases and the trendy, the trendy things of, you know, are you organic or are you farm to table? And I just didn't said it that day. Like, well, all food is grown at a farm, but, but geez, you gotta, you gotta know, you gotta know what it is. So, you know, I'm not, not trying to buy off, you know, big commodity farms where I don't have any connection to anyone. I think, I think that that's something that everyone could, you know, take a little piece of that in your life and, and get back to it where, you know, you don't have the worlds of the Costco's and the Walmarts and your one-stop shops or your phone calls or, you know, your internet to just get it up and, you know, that you had those, those connections. And and I find there's less greed in those relationships uh, (laughs) where, you know, you have this bond with someone, your friends, your friends and your business partners where, you know, I, I need these farmers and to succeed and, and thrive. <laughs> Absolutely. What's yeah. good for them is good for me. I'm just part right. of the process. I happen to be the the part of the process that's usually in front of a microphone or a camera. So the best thing I can do is is say like, oh, I you know I get all my seafood from Organic Ocean, or I I use Ramona's you know tepary beans and all of their products as as much as I can, <clears throat> and 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 that's all I want to really be. I guess as an ambassador for the story. I don't, I definitely didn't, I didn't create it. I just get to tell it. Yeah. And, and I, I feel like when you processed, when you've done a lot of processing, well, first of all, I think it makes you humble because it's like, Mm -hmm. it's a, um, equalizing it's labor that equalizes humans. It's like, Hey, we all have to eat. And for us to eat, this processes have to happen. And so you're participating in this thing that you're like, how did we ever get so opulent and so wealthy that humans don't know how to process their own food anymore? I mean, it's amazing exactly. that we've even achieved that. <laughs> right. But, You're um, teaching someone you know, how so- to take like, the, like, hey, I need you to floret that broccoli and I have a, you know, a new cook just looking at it and like, pick up, pick up <laughs> your knife and just... Yeah. You're going to cut it into what it looks like you buy at the store. Does that, you know, does that transcend to you at all or, or not? But I think it's just it. It's, and it's also, you know, my guys, there's too much work 
to be done in our business for me not to be hands-on nor right. <clears throat> nor do i have the desire to not be hands-on so like you said it's 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 humbling but but also bond forming that yeah. that my dishwasher and me are most likely standing next to each other right processing something during dinner service every night I've become convinced that the origin of music is in food processing. It's like it has to be. she's pounding a stone over here, yep. or he's scraping <laughs> a mono over here, and before you yeah. know it, you guys get in a rhythm. I mean, so talk about bonding. And then I think another component too is when when a company's making really big profits off food, once you've processed enough food, you start to understand it can't be good. It can't mm-hmm. be good food. You can't cut really cut corners like that to where you have that big of a profit margin if you're actually dealing with high quality ingredients. There is no, there's barely enough margin for everybody. So when you see companies making hand over fist money on food, you're like, man, whatever the people, whoever's eating that, I feel bad for them because it's not food. Right. Well, and I, you know, I have people, we have a strict rule not to go over 60 people at any, at any one given seating ever in a restaurant in in Mm pop-ups and collaboration and in anything because I, I've just found over the course of time that over that <clears throat> amount, you really start compromising the integrity of the food, which, you know, it's, it's a trickle down effect. You, <clears throat> you mess up the story. It's, it's becoming about money. It's be- not becoming about, you know, the quality anymore. And it's just, again, it just it trickles all the way down where I've had people say like, hey, you know, maybe a bigger company than me or, you know, people that are out there in the wedding world or the larger event world of, of caterers where, you know, I've never really considered myself a catering chef because if I, if it's, if someone asks me for anything over 60, we usually refer them to someone else. I've, I've had other, you know, groups of chefs that say like, Hey, you know, we could all get together and I could bring my whole team and you could bring your whole team and we, let's do this for 200 people. I'm like, no, nah, you're already missing my point because <laughs> yeah. how am I going to talk? How am I going to, you know, how am I going to connect with those people? And, you know, I don't want to scream over a microphone or a megaphone and it just, you know, uh, right out of the gate, I'm, it's missing the point of what I'm trying to do. Like 20, 20 to 40 people is my sweet spot. You know, I can, I can, I can see every single person and, and, and interact with everyone and, and, and really hold that intimacy and, in, you know, in the palms of your hands and, and, and not control the dinner, but guide the people on the journey that you're trying to take them on. Yeah. And yeah. And the journey that they're there to be on. So exactly <laughs> making sure they're actually getting it. So I'm thinking I've got a lot of friends in Arizona who are going to hear this or, you know, people who are hearing sure. this that are, are going to travel to Arizona at some point. How do they get, get access to your food, man? Like, um, how can they, uh, work with you or, or, or what, how you talked often, about a restaurant that's coming up. Yep. Uh, we're looking like we're gonna, uh, open up a new restaurant just North of Sedona up in Oak Creek Canyon. Like we've, you know, touched on a couple of times that, you know, that drastic, uh, rise right up into Flagstaff, uh, a little lodge that we'd had our eyes on for a while. And, you know, we were talking about just biding our time through the pandemic and not rushing into anything and, and really North or know. South of the spring when you're driving up there, there's the, uh, the double faucetted spring, you know, where people stop to fill water bottles. Yeah. Just North. Okay. So cool. we've got about a week. Or, yeah. Oh, it's, it's amazing. I mean, and to be able to live back in there and, <clears throat> and cook and forage and, and be able to create programs of, you know, <clears throat> guests at the hotel being able to, you know, sign up for amenities that include foraging, that include fly fishing, that include, you know, all these things that, that I've been doing kind of satellited or in locations where people want us for specific occasions to, you know, bringing it all back <clears throat> into, you know, a, you know, a nice, nicer high end restaurant, small uh, group event and different amenities. Like, like I said, just a long walk through nature before dinner is going to get you more connected to, right. you know, what it is we're up to than, than just sitting down. So the more, <clears throat> the more interaction I can have with someone that's going to eat our food, I feel like the better connection I'm going to have with them at the end. And, and the more that, you know, it's understood, you know, the point that that's trying to be made. Yeah. So folks are driving from Sedona up through Oak Creek Canyon on the way to Flagstaff will find uh, a restaurant soon uh, in yep. there. Yep. That's awesome. That's so fantastic. a couple, I think a week or so, and we'll uh, announce it to the world. But I mean, 
in the last few years, you know, people will ask me for <clears throat> a business card once every two or three months. And I don't typically get them because we're also connected to one another on Instagram and, and right, social right. media and things like that, that I just say like, yeah, find me on Instagram, you know, and it's, it's that easy. It's more often, it's more often that someone's got an Instagram than, than I have a business card on me. So, yeah. I get, get uh, home and throw them away anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was just, a, I, I'll stack them up for years on end, never have used one of them. You know, there's a stack the size of your fist and then they just go in the trash. <clears throat> uh, and, and so, you know, just a little bit of a less carbon footprint, I guess, on one note, but on, on another note, you know, most of the people that we do take foraging, you know, out for the day are <clears throat> the people that have, you know, found us through, you know, on social media, but, you know, seen us seen us in one publication or tv <clears throat> this or tv that uh at one point but they're they're most they're most often coming from out of town and and you know can find us can find us that way wild arizona cuisines on instagram and 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 i'm on instagram so uh the 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 business one i don't have the the final say in the in the postings my wife tells me that i can leave that up to my personal one yeah, exactly. Don't mess with the boss. No, yeah, um, right. The, ni- the nice pictures go over there. Yeah. Well, I want to get out next year and work with you uh, for the TV show for Wild Fed and, and uh, just get to hang with you, man. And I'd love to come visit the restaurant when it's open. So Yeah, it'll be perfect timing, going. man. Yeah. Yeah, we'd fantastic. love to have you. I'd love to have you. Well, I, thank you for what you're doing. Um, geez, I'm, I'm really impressed with the integrity uh, behind your food and um, – your willingness to put in the work that it takes to get that kind of food. So just yeah, awesome. I know support. we probably, yeah, I think we probably just scratched the surface on what you're actually doing, but uh, it's really, it's really awesome and refreshing to hear. And in a place that um, it's got to be pretty hard to do out there. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, well uh, done, man. Well done. I tell people often mother nature is my only boss, you know, yeah, you don't mess with wife, wife on the side, but you don't mess with mother nature at all. Every no. time I've, every time I've tempted her, she's always one. So I try not yeah. to do it anymore. <laughs> right on. Thanks for listening to the wild fed podcast. Help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. If you still haven't seen season one of the Wild Fed TV show, you can go to myoutdoortv.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 10 episodes. Season two of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2022. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.